Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Dear viewers, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. A very good evening and welcome to the first edition of Behind the Headlines here in 2022. A very happy new year to all of you, dear viewers. We pray it is a year full of happiness, success, prosperity, good health, and all that is good. in this life and the next for you and your loved ones inshallah ta'ala ameen ya rabbal alamin and sadly 2021 was another challenging year but it did bring hope did it not for the good things to come uh, once we get beyond the challenges of this terrible coronavirus pandemic which as we speak is still costing lives here in the UK and around the world and we continuously make dua to all of those who have been affected by this terrible pandemic may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them patience and strength during this difficult time and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of those who are suffering shifa from this terrible illness ameen ya rabbal alamin it's myself ahmed bostan with you in this beautiful beautiful month of january it's very cold outside but we are looking to warm up your hearts inshallah as we embark on another set of inspiration in the form of a series of guests that you'll be seeing throughout 2022 inshallah god willing to inspire motivate and infuse all of us to do better in our lives to rise to those heights that we never dreamt of before never mind thought about becoming a reality in the form of inspirational guests that have alhamdulillah contributed so much not only to the british muslim community but to the wider communities at large remember this is a live program we come to you live on this beautiful Friday evening, Friday the 7th of January 2021, so you can, 22 rather, so you can of course call us here in the studio on 01924-231-083, you can contact us on Twitter, we're at British Muslim TV, we are also British Muslim TV on Facebook. Now today, for the first program in 2022, it gives me the great honour and privilege to speak to an inspirational man who has transformed the lives of literally tens of thousands of young people who has contributed in an exemplary manner to the lives of so many of our communities not only here but also abroad i remember first meeting him a number of years ago when i had the great pleasure of being in rochdale doing some charity work and i was absolutely inspired by the love the young people had for this brother and have for this brother and indeed the sheer amount of work that he has done in order to transform their lives in what have been very difficult circumstances it hasn't been easy in recent times to give the provision that our young people require all of you who are parents teachers involved in the lives of young people will be aware of that but muhammad sharaz is one such individual from the great place we know as rochdale that has been able to do that in such a beautiful manner and i'm honored and privileged that he's my guest this evening assalamu alaikum Brother Muhammad Sharaz, Jazakallah Khair. Thank you very much for giving us the immense honor of joining me on British Muslim TV tonight. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, peace and blessings to you, and firstly to you, Ahmed Bostan, um, for giving me the opportunity this evening on British Muslim TV. Uh, and I would like to just say a thank you to all of you uh, that are watching at home as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sharaz. And Sharaz, I want to start at the very beginning you grew up in the late 70s early 80s what was life like growing up in the beautiful place that mashallah you still call home rochdale yes uh, a trip down memory lane yes so growing up uh, as a as a young child uh, in the 19 early 80s uh, my my memories are of getting up in the mornings in the winter times and having seen the beautiful snow as we've had today in some areas of uh, Rochdale as well um and getting it covered up to our knee rolls um you know when we used to go to school uh, get dressed in the morning and trudge along with your friends and your brothers and sisters um and and in those days when we were back in then um the jackets we had the the, the clothes that we were wearing um used to just say right and we never felt the cold but it was just a, a playful joyful time whether it was in the summer whether it was going to school in the morning um and some of the things that we were doing when we were growing up uh, the activities that we were involved in and some of the basic things of just playing local games in the, in, mm. the, in our local areas 
so for me, it was all about, you know, when we were playing games such as a slate, there used to be a game that we used to play with youngsters common with a slate, uh, just find a few stones and find a tennis ball or something and just play along with each other, uh, stay out till the evening, um, go and play with friends on bicycle rides, go down the hills, build a den. Uh, these were some of the things that I grew up with, unfortunate enough with some of my friends that I grew up with that we were around at that time, mm. going vi- going visiting our local youth club that we had and bless my my first initial contact with a youth worker. She was a, a, a blessed lady called Mary from Bernardo's who would organise events and key things for us to do, whether it was bonfire night, uh, having treacle, uh, black uh, black coffee beans or whichever it was mm. activities that we did so you know it was that sense of belonging and for us it was like wow what, what we're doing you know what mm. can we do so we, we explored for the limits you know reaching staying out in the woods making dens playing having bonfires um, and that was a lovely time that we, we all grew up in and and the music or whichever in terms of the things that we were doing around us we were also influenced by that as well so sure for, so, so getting involved in uh, activities in and around the school and mm. the community itself, really. So I, I can't complain. I, I, I had a lovely uh, time and we took part in those activities, yeah. Mm. And were these organised activities in the typical sense that you uh, would think about today in the form of youth and community centres or was this literally just a group of children and young people coming together with a few adults passionate about giving back to the children and young people in the local community and just organising whatever took their fancy, really? Yes, I, I suppose in them days for us, um, you know, we had the concept of where, you know, we, we learned from our elders. Uh, we had a lot of... Uh, re- uh, respect for our elders, the elderly community, the, the sacrifices that they've given for us. Um, so they were there to show us the ropes and guide us and support us and tell us what right is right, where wrong is wrong. Um, and I think that was a great opportunity for us uh, to to learn and, and to gain all that experience. Uh, but for young people, it was about what can we do? We sat at home, uh, you know, whether we're watching the television or in, there, in those days when we had the video recorders, when they had the VHSs, mm. um, you know, binoculars um so playful times for us we don't have everything that we have in today's society and in today's day and age where all the the latest devices and everything else that you can get a hold of in those days what we were given resources we had we make we, we made do with them uh, and we tried our best to be resourceful um and that's what the creativity was in those days is being imaginative um working with your friends design designing things organizing things and just preparing and mm. and just using natural things that we could do. Uh, sure. And that was our playful time. Mm. And what was life like economically then for the British Muslim community, for uh, British minority ethnic communities generally? I suppose a lot of uh, Pakistani Indian families were around 20 or some even 30 years in to uh, their journey when they first arrived in the United Kingdom. What was the economic situation like for many families yes. in Rochdale? Yes, definitely. You know, uh, I mean, I'm I'm a son of a of an immigrant. My my father arrived in the late '60s, early uh, yeah, in the late '60s, and he was working in a textile factory. And I remember when my dad used to get up in the mornings at seven in the morning uh, and go to work till seven in the evening, do a twelve hour shift, and they'd do that for uh, for seven days a week. Um, so you know, you'd see him on a Friday. On a Friday, they'd probably sometimes they, if they get a day off or a, at an hour off early, they'd come home, and we'd be all running out to go and wait and greet Dad to say, "Look, he's got his wages today. What we're going to do at the weekend? Uh, we're going to go to town. Uh, we're going to go and visit because it used to be a weekly." weekly gathering to go to town so on Saturdays we'd go to our local town centre whether it was Woolworths mm. or wh- whatever it, the shops were so that was something for us to look forward to um, but in those days you know obviously working uh, in factories Rochdale is a mill town mm. lots of textile factories here so the economic situation here where people were from uh, migrant backgrounds or from the majority of the South Asian countries um, they were working in, in these factories and just earning a, a, a daily living, really, um, to help and support their families that were here. And not just here, those families that they'd left behind um, and come to uh, the UK to to settle down. Uh, but everyone had harmony, everyone had love and respect and tolerance for each other. And, you know, we'd go and go to a friend's house and we'd go meet up there or we'd arrange other events, uh, go to the local shop or somewhere. Uh, we'd go and walk together, mm. take friends and, and, and just enjoy ourselves, really. And, and that was the main thing for us, that there was a lot of unity at the time. And I remember when I was a child at that time, there was a there used to be a local uh, facility in our areas where 
uh, there used to be like a drop-in place where we'd just go and meet together. So, so, so some of our friends would just, you know, whether it was me or, or other friends that we had, we'd just get mm. together and uh, go and enjoy and do things socially. Mm, mm. And what's really interesting in what you say there, Shiraz, was that that community cohesion between communities from all backgrounds came naturally, just happened like that. There didn't need to be a concerted effort or a, or an initiative by anyone to bring people together. It was going on naturally. How did that happen? And perhaps how, what have we lost that has led to a, a, a need for such initiatives and projects that we've seen, especially in recent times? Yeah, I would say, you know, uh, we would have our, our places of worship were only few. So where we had our local facilities, albeit the mosque, everyone went to the same area, was living in the same area, or they had one or two mosques. So we'd always, we'd, we'd always frequent in those areas. There'd be more of us there. Um, so it was a connection. It was a social hub. Um, so whether it was uh, the, the events that were going out through the year, whether it was Ramadan, whether it was Eid, mm. or other functions going out, we knew that, right, there's a place for us that we could go and uh, socialise or meet or stand around mm. or meet others as well. Um, and at the same time, the local shops that we had, you know, there weren't many, but the, the few that we had, we, we'd always bump into each other or you knew that, right, somebody's uh, got an event going on or something, some, somebody's arranging something. How can we go? What can we do? So people had that bond. People had that uh, respect for each other. And, and and that itself, you know, was the key thing for us because sure. there was no there was no mobile phones mm. that ring somebody up and say, right, meet me at seven o'clock, meet me at six o'clock. Of course, you, yes. You, you just go to places mm. and just wait and you, you'd take part in where you were and what you were doing. And sure. then you'd just wait for uh, sunrise to turn up uh, in, in the evening when you when you were around and you just make, your well, make yourself uh, way, way back home or mm. make sure that like, you get home before uh, to get your Absolutely. tea or supper. Absolutely. Muhammad Shiraz is our guest uh, this evening, talking to him about his life and work, a renowned youth and community worker today, but someone who has really contributed a huge amount to the lives of literally tens of thousands of young people, not only in Rochdale and the wider United Kingdom, but around the world. We're going to continue our conversation with Muhammad Shiraz right after this break. Stay tuned to British Muslim TV. Dear viewers, assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Behind the Headlines here on British Muslim TV. Today, in conversation with the renowned youth and community worker, Muhammad Shiraz, someone who has spent over 25 years transforming the lives of children and young people. But today, we're talking to him about his life, his journey, his inspiration, and where he came from. And just before the break, Shiraz, we were with you in Rochdale during your childhood, speaking about the memories you have of that time and you really reflected upon the happiness, the joy, the contentment in the hearts of many young children and young people at that time, including yourself. Where did the passion for youth work come from? Did you have that at a young age? Did you uh, envisage yourself becoming a youth and community worker growing up? Was that your dream job at school? No, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think of that. Um, I think as a young age, um, living and growing up in the early 80s and surrounded by elders. Um, and because I was at primary school and because I was uh, in school and, and, and I knew English, a lot of the elders would come to me from the community and say, Shiraz, uh, we've got this letter here, we've got this form here, what does it say? Mm. Um, so my uh, innovation into community work was uh, having a look at people's passport forms, having a read of their uh, letters that had arrived from the local authority. And from there, it was like, well, Shiraz, you know, he lives on our street and he can help us out and have a look at it. So for me, that bond started to develop from there because then uh, people would pass on my details and say, oh, go, go and see Shiraz, he'll have a word with you or he'll have a look at it. And then from there, I started to engage with organisations or local authority and having a look how things were. Um, I was at college when I left college. Uh, when I left school, uh, when I did all levels or GCSEs, I didn't get the grades that many do get. But what I did was uh, whatever I did take in my GCSEs, 
Uh, I went on to college to do something in computing, BIT computing, I think I did, uh, mm. in my local college. Uh, and I thought, you know what, it's, it's, everyone's doing computing, I might as well join the bandwagon, and mm. I did do. Um, however, from there, uh, an event that took place when I went to university in uh, Huddersfield in 1996, I was studying uh, HND business and finance. Um, the following year, in '97, my brother sadly passed away. Who was I'm the youngest in the family. My brother sadly passed away at the age of 21, and he'd had uh, a, a, uh, he'd already had a baby boy. Uh, he was one year one year and a half old. And uh, my niece, she was born 10 days after my brother sadly passed away. And then I decided to leave university and I said, you know what, uh, I need to help and bring up my nephew and uh, support my uh, family here. Mm. Uh, and then from then on, um, what happened was during that time, whilst I was often helping and supporting my family, um, there was an earthquake, I think it was, or floods. There were floods in Bangladesh. And um, when the floods took place in Bangladesh and I saw that on the TV and, and I thought, you know, what can we do? So I went to our local uh, youth project, Kashmir Youth Project, and I sat down with one of the officers there and I said, look, we want to do something. Uh, how can we help our people? And from there, we managed to, we said, look, you know what, let's organise a charity dinner. Uh, for the fa the families that have been affected. Let's just host an event. So my first ever event that I did when I was about uh, 15, 16 years old, I took part in, um, was the Bangladesh Fruit Appeal. And from there, it was just about helping and organizing people and supporting people, uh, seeing how they were and how we could help people across the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we live our, we live our lives here. So that's how I got involved into, into helping and supporting. And when I did that event, one of... Uh, the managers uh, who, who spotted me there uh, said, you know what, uh, you're good at bringing young people together and organizing this event and really well done. Why don't you consider doing youth work? And I thought, youth work, what is that? So mm. he said, no, why don't you go and study that at university or college? You know, you, there is time to go back and go study again. So I, I took upon his words. I kept on volunteering at my local youth club at uh, KYP. Um, but then uh, I went to do my degree in 1998. Uh, and when I did my degree in 1998 in youth and community studies at Bradford. Um, I was fortunate enough to then take a, get a job with Rochdale Council as a, as a sessional worker here based in Rochdale. Mm. And that's how the journey began for me then. Um, and then I said, right, I'll go back to my hometown and let's get young people involved, seeing the deprivation around the area, seeing the disadvantaged uh, mm. communities that we had. So I wanted to see, look, how can we make people's lives better? Oh. How can we encourage young people to do well in their lives, mm. to aspire, to inspire, yes. uh, and give them that opportunity? Mm. And it's incredible to hear, Shiraz, that, that huge personal loss for you of your brother, not only in your mind was a loss, but also brought within you, even at such a young age, barely 20 or so years old, a huge sense of responsibility to your nephew, to your very young niece, and how you regarded yourself responsible for them. Whereas some people would say today, people, even families, tend to live very separate lives in terms of they have their own challenges, their own struggles, their own joys, and tend to be quite busy in their own lives. Have you seen a change in terms of families and how families interact with one another compared to times back then? Because for you, as it sounds, it was almost a, a no-brainer for you to literally go and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop everything because I've got this family to support. Yes, you know, and back in those days, um, you know, you had to deal with the situations that, that were, you, were, you were finding yourselves in. Um, nowadays, there are a lot of support services, there are a lot of places that you can reach out and maybe uh, we weren't fortunate enough at that time that we, we'd have to rely on our extended family support mm. and reach out to each other and help each other whereas nowadays young people you know there's so many services out there that uh, Childline, Bernardo's, uh, help uh, save the children etc so uh, young people can uh, and are able to to reach out to those services and say, look, you know, we need help and support. But the family disconnection. So now, back in those days, and looking at how financially people now are, or economically how well mm. they are, you know, these factors do play a big part in in the way you are gr you're growing up, or how the rest of your life is going to be shaped. But when you have a tragedy, or you know, whenever you are, come upon uh, come upon sometimes these things in life, mm. you, you have to sink or swim. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's keeping your head above that water uh, and saying, you know what, uh, it's it's happened, but how do we go forward? I mean, I yes. used to say to my young people all the time, uh, I said, look, problems, you know, don't bring me a problem, bring the solution with it. Mm. Yeah. So every problem has a solution. So yes. let's find the solution. So whether it's going from A to Z or whether it's taking a day, a month, a week, let's head, the focus should be in how to address the issue, how to resolve it. You know, uh, and never look at it as a problem. Always see and look at it from a positive to say, let's fix that problem. Let's fix that opportunity. Let's try something different. Mm. Let's let's give in and, and try what else is a solution is available. Indeed. So you entered youth work in terms of your education. You studied the area. At that time, that transition for you, because I would imagine that was also the time when computers themselves were starting to become far more popular. People would have never anticipated how big IT as a profession has now become. Did you have that in the back of your mind that maybe I need to go back and do IT? Maybe computers are the career to go in now financially and for my own stability? Yes, because you you probably, yeah, we probably did think at the time that, you know, all these uh, computers, people were people are joining the bandwagon or people are thinking, you know what, IT is the way forward and mm-hmm. uh, programming and this is what we should be doing. Everything's going to be clerical, admin work, office work, you know, whereas your manual work where you've got your traditional stuff or your working uh, patterns that you had, you always thought to yourself, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up, um, how it's going to be. But in my mind, I'd, I'd made that decision that, you know what, um, if you can lend a shoulder to somebody if you can help and support somebody in their tough time if you can go through them with their journey if you can in in their hour of need if you can be that pillar of support that's what people need at the time Mm -hmm. Um, the rest of the period uh, you know people come to terms with grief people come to terms with their situations but it's that crucial time when that people need that help and support Uh, but at the same time you know modern technology now and 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 then you know little did we think that 15 years later, 10 years later, you know, we'd have mobile devices in our hands that we can call people around the world and, mm-hmm. and, and resolve issues and see people and, and, and communication has just, you know, it's just the, the digitalization and the transformation has just been so quick um, that we've had to get onto the ladder and, and, and make sure that we're ahead and we're up to speed and we know what's going on because pe- young people, uh, boys and girls, they're very tech savvy. You know, mm. uh, in, in those days, we may not have had the technology where we're bringing up PCSOs or um, going to telephones and, and, and the PCSOs that they had in those days uh, was stand in line and wait for a call for two minutes and you were ringing back and forward to Pakistan or any other country. Mm. You'd have to wait for what's going on. Yes. And, and it's changed so much. Even uh, simple phone calls abroad were a struggle, were a problem. And uh, We were speaking just before we came on air about how people would literally send tape recordings of messages and that's how you would hear about your family back home in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh or wherever your family come from and and how times have now changed where you now have electronic platforms and internet platforms through which you can communicate any time of the day or night internationally, no matter where you are. And it's it's accessible for, for everyone to get involved. And just a question before we go to the break, Shiraz, that evolution of technology, you mentioned how young people nowadays are very tech savvy. How have young people coped with that technological transformation, do you think? Yes, I would say, you know, young people now, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's they need to order stuff online, we've all had to get used to, to uh, ordering, whether it's Uber or taxis or food. Young people are now just at the comfort of their home, at the comfort of their uh, living rooms or, or, or the bedrooms, they can just order food, clothes, everything, just at, a t- at the touch of a button. Mm. Um, so the, the time that is saving you. But yes, at the same time, it's about then letting young people know that if you have got a job, if you have got the income, you've got the money in the bank, the, the card will only pay what you've got in the bank. If you haven't got money in the bank to pay for these things, your card is useless. Mm. Uh, so at the same time, it's about giving them the values and understanding of right, uh, getting a good job, having some employment, saving up your money. Um, when there is a rainy day like we've had throughout this pandemic now, young people, older people, everyone, you know, the, financially people have found it difficult because mm. 
you know, when if, if things were not allowed, if they were not allowed to go out, if they're shielding at home mm. uh, or if they're helping and supporting their family members, young people have been caring for their family relatives at home. Yes. Live in large, some of the Asian families are large mm. extended families. So you have mm. to help and support others as well. Um, so, yeah, it's about budgeting. It's about learning. Sure, it's also sure. about giving them that experience sure, uh, and then sure. teaching them that, look, mm. you know, mm. um, have the resources. You've got the resources at your disposal now. Yes. For sure. Uh, we are going to continue talking about those challenges as well and, and the various uh, stages of challenge that uh, sadly we've seen that young people have seen in particular in recent times. But we are coming up to a break. This is Behind the Headlines. It's British Muslim TV and we're live till 8 p.m. tonight. Back right after this break. Dear viewers, assalamu alaikum and welcome back. This is Behind the Headlines here on British Muslim TV, the home of where we interview the most inspirational, motivational people that you have ever met, be it virtually, you've met them, alhamdulillah, on this program. And today we're honoured and privileged to be joined by the renowned youth and community worker, Muhammad Sharaz, who has literally transformed the lives of tens of thousands of young people from Rochdale to Lahore to all over the world, mashallah. This uh, brother and his contribution has been truly exemplary uh, when you uh, look at the difference it has made to the lives of so many young people in what have been extremely challenging times. And Shiraz, I just want to talk about those challenges. When you entered youth work, it was during a time when uh, it's never enough money, but certainly significant sums of money were being invested in young people's services, community services. But after the economic crash that we saw in 2008, youth services have, have been significantly affected in terms of the provision in Rochdale and across the country. Yes, most definitely. You know, uh, the cutbacks that we've had and we've faced, uh, it's been very difficult for local authorities uh, to sustain the provisions in some of the areas we had. The, the youth provision that we had in our area uh, in, let me just give you an example, in Rochdale, um, it was campaigned for by two young people. Uh, one was Farouk Ahmed and one was, uh, bless a good friend, uh, Ibra Khan. These two young people, uh, ha and alongside others, had campaigned for this youth facility for young people because they'd identified that where are young people going to socialise? What do they need to do? So they'd planned and agreed with the local authority and managed to get this resource in the area. That small portal cabin was a lifeline to hundreds and thousands for the next 10 years that we had uh, whilst we were here in Rochdale. Um, and boys and girls that entered that youth provision, um, the staff helped and gave them opportunities, information, advice, guidance, support, um, to give them a shelter. That place was there as a roof over their heads. Uh, and that provision itself, um, was, uh, you know, for, for many people, like I've just said, uh, a place that they could come and have a chat with us, mm. drink a tea and coffee. Um, and then the cutbacks itself, when they came along, I mean, let me give you an example. Back in 2001, you know, when we had neighbouring towns that had the riots in Burnley, Bradford, Oldham, Rochdale, we were very, very lucky and fortunate because us youth workers, we had a we had a lot of respect from the young people, and it was about having that loyalty and respect for the young people that we didn't want our town to go up in smoke. Uh, mm. We didn't we didn't want our town uh, to become targeted by others. Um, so we were fortunate enough that the groundwork that we'd worked with young people, the staff gave us that respect in, in terms of not going out and destroying the image of our town. Uh, we're proud of the cohesion of our town, of our borough. Yes, we face challenges, you know, yes, we have opportunities, uh, but nine times out of 10, uh, on the positive side, we, we, we're a positive uh, communities and areas where young people can feel that they're honoured and they're proud and they're, and they're privileged to live here. Um, and then the cutbacks, the youth locals, local authority, when they came along, they had to decide on what, what areas uh, are going to suffer in mm. terms of what provisions we had. So our area, sadly, the youth club was shut down um in back in uh, 2000 i think it was 12 or 13 uh so what we had to do then was reach out to other services um empower the young people to give them a voice and say get involved locally um some of the provisions that we had 
uh, that weren't uh, around in the area, uh, young people then uh, decided that, right, there's nowhere else for them to go. What can we do? So hanging around bus shelters or they were hanging around local provisions and bus stations. Mm. So the challenges were even greater. Um, but, you know, some of those young people that we worked with, uh, we were proud to say me and alongside my other colleagues that I worked with, um, some of the best youth workers I've ever worked with in my life. And sadly, some of those that have passed away, I, I give an example, brother, um, late Yazin Khan, me and him were very, very close when we did our youth work sessions. Mm -hmm. And some of these young people, they've gone on to now become doctors, pharmacists, lawyers, barristers, uh, professionals in the dentists. Uh, so a lot of professional jobs that they've gone into. And for us, that's the, that's the value of our job. Uh, and that's the value what that we saw mm. and satisfaction that knowing that he or she have progressed. I even had the first uh, Asian worker, that she, uh, female worker that was an air hostess for um, uh, back in, I forgot the airline's name now, uh, but she was so proud to become the first air hostess as an Asian female at the age of what, 18, 19. Mm. And that honour that it gave her family and herself. So there's so many stories that we can share uh, of success that we've had. And mm. we wish them all the best. You know, they've gone on to better and uh, bigger and better things in their lives. And we were just that stepping board. We were just that place where they came to. And we said, here's your, here's, here's your wings. Go and fly. Yeah. Wow. Um, and give that opportunity to them. Mm. And sadly, we had some young people that weren't... weren't uh, <laughs> Uh, successful mm. and, and they may have gone down the, the, the other route or negative route or the bad routes or gone into uh, uh, behavior that's not good and then we worked with them as well so we never mm. gave them up I used to do me and my colleague we used to go visit young people in prisons we'd go and visit them um, in uh, our weekends where we would take their parents with us as well so the challenges we had we had to take them on board with the community and then find the solutions for them yes. as well um, so yeah so and then where we find ourselves now um, is, you know, you've got a lot of organizations now through pandemic that have actually, the community centers have shut down. Uh, they weren't open, people were shielding. So where can a young person go? You know, if they're not, they're not at home, you know, mm. uh, they're having to sit at home, they're having to use computers. Have they got a, a laptop or computer to mm. be shared between siblings? Um, you know, music's going on in one room and disruptions in the other and you can't listen or you're on Zoom session. So, these are the challenges and difficulties that yes. people have found as well. Mm. Uh, and, and the only places, sadly, some of these places that they can't, they, get, they have to go to and they frequent is going out and finding out where the space is. So the space might just be at your local uh, fruit and dessert place or it might be at your local uh, centre that may have a drop-in session for an hour or so, but mm. nothing concrete. Yes, and these are the, the challenges, the unprecedented challenges that the coronavirus has presented and what many people have commented on is how COVID has really highlighted in a stark reality the huge inequalities which exist in our society that you've actually there reflected on, Shiraz, digital poverty that people are suffering. But do you think that this will make a long-term change in the lives of young people? Will we be able to create virtual spaces where young people can be involved and be engaged or is there really no replacement for that community center that youth center that snooker club that they can go to and uh, socialize as well as learn and grow yes i think that's that's the the greater challenge we have now uh, because people have had to live in these circumstances in their own households in their own homes uh, and not be able to reach out to places um, and then the crucial role now will be on faith places, whether it's be a, a mosque or a church. Um, these centres now have the onus and added responsibility um, to become the local community hopes. So if your local community centre, if it's available, if it's not available, where can the young people go and socialise? What is available? Um, and if they have to do things online, so, you know, Young people now, if you look at it, they've set up their own businesses, entrepreneurship, you know, they're selling things or items on online, um, Instagram, uh, TikTok, which whatever spectrum it is digitally now, there is an opportunity to build from there. And it gives people the platform uh, to, and to, to develop um, and to be creative and imaginative um, and, and produce and economically, you know, if they can get if they can get some financial reward out of that, that's albeit that's the best for them as well. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at that. Yes, the challenges are there, yes. uh, but 
you know, when we used to go to weddings, we'd sit there with a thousand people or 500 people, mm. depending on the gathering. The, the, during COVID, we've realized that they went down to the bare minimum, 30 guests allowed, um, for, you know, 40 guests allowed. So a lot of family members have lost out that connection or they've not been able to meet loved ones and through genuine reasons. Um, so there is, you know, when whenever there is a challenges, there's always hope. Mm. And that hope is something that we should never uh, lose upon. Uh, and until that light is still flickering or still switched on, I always say, never, ever give up, you know, be yourself, do what you can, give it your best. Um, and, you know, you will get reward in the end. Absolutely. And as you said, there are an enormous amount of opportunities that uh, the online space, the virtual space has created, not least for those entrepreneurs that are at home and looking to see how they can earn some money as well as following a particular passion of theirs. But how has the pandemic been for you, Shiraz, as youth and community workers, you mentioned before how you were able to physically be there to save a young person from going into a life of, of criminality and of no good to actually today becoming the doctors, the professors, the lawyers, the barristers that we have, and it's youth workers like you that made that fundamental change. How have you been able to support young people during the pandemic? Yes, so during the pandemic, we realized that the greatest need was also around food poverty uh, because people were struggling. They'd lost their jobs. Uh, their hours have been shortened. Uh, they've uh, been furloughed. The shielding at home. So the challenge it presented to us is working in Rochdale, we work with different organizations as well. So we also help and provide stuff around homelessness. Uh, homelessness. Uh, we also provide stuff around uh, asylum and refugee support. So all these groups that we've got, um, we realised that the pressure that came from these uh, families was was affecting their children's and their and their daily lives. Mm. That having a simple meal at home or having a hot meal uh, to share between others, the cost of it, or they haven't got their, uh, they have, the money hasn't arrived for the benefits or for those struggling that their money hasn't been paid into their account. They, it was the unknown. So young people here, we decided to set up uh, and carry on our food bank uh, that we had the food deliveries on Tuesday. So we were providing uh, rice and chicken curry on a Tuesday evening. Mm. Uh, then from there, we were providing clothes and other provisions as well, uh, another food provision. So what we then decided, and, and as a group, what we continued is, let's keep this going. The needs of the community are greater. Mm. We're here on a, on a weekly basis. What can we do help and provide? And then we started to see a rise in people and families families accessing us. Uh, and that service that we've continued now ever since the pandemic, the food kitchen was here sadly five years ago, but during the pandemic, the need was far even greater. Mm. Um, young people then coming and making food parcels um, at KYP uh, one weekend where we got all the food in um, and we said to uh, our staff teams and volunteers, come in, let's pack all the food that's required, mm. uh, getting all the information. And the young people were out and about helping and supporting all day long, packing the food parcels, and then having a team of volunteers to go out and deliver. Um, young people then just buddying up with each other, talking to each other to keep themselves uh, motivated. But as you're aware mm. now, yes. mental health is uh, has been on the rise. And through this pandemic, it's been a very, very difficult period uh, for, lo for a lot of families. And now the real issues are coming out of what we're learning from uh, the, the, the pandemic is. Absolutely. We will continue to talk about those challenges, Charles, but we do have to take a quick break. We'll be back right after this. Dear viewers, salam alaikum and welcome back to the final segment here of Behind the Headlines here on British Muslim TV, the home of where we document the lives of inspirational leaders, people who have contributed in an exemplary manner to their local communities, nationally and even internationally in the case of our guest Muhammad Sharaz, someone who over the past 25 years has transformed the lives of tens of thousands of young people, a man, mashallah, with limitless energy and determination to do good, and someone who has been at the forefront of addressing those challenges of young people and our communities as they have arisen. And Shiraz, just before the break, you were speaking about the huge challenges and ramifications that COVID 
continues to have and will have even after we get beyond it around people's mental health, around the fact that people have lost their jobs and are struggling to get into alternative employment. How do we start to unpack that? How do we start to address that, uh, Shiraz, given the significant impact it's had particularly on some of our most economically deprived communities, including Rochdale? Yes, and I think, um, you know, rightly so, in terms of some of the challenges that we face are going to be uh, building up some support groups and networks, um, having these platforms where, uh, whether it's for an elderly uh, elderly uh, men's and women's groups to be established, or if we're looking at having uh, women's only groups, um, having young people's groups. So wherever there is a circus, um, circus, wherever there is a focus around the issue, that's what we need to look at. We need to identify uh, what are the common issues that people are having? Um, so looking at places where they can frequent, where they can meet safely in this environment, because obviously at the moment we're still going through this new variant. Um, so in in line with following the guidelines, what can we do? How can we do this? And and just making sure that if there is a if there is something that's available, whether it's online or whether it's at a physical place that you can actually go and help and support, um, that's making sure that we can provide those areas and and reach out to those people that need the help because some people may not be aware of where these services are mm -hmm. um you know because some people that have got the technology they've got the know-how they'll get the whatsapp messages but if somebody's at home they're isolated they don't have no internet uh, coverage digital poverty how do we reach out to them as well mm. the schools have done a wonderful job the local authorities are working in partnership with organizations and businesses and everything else to say how can we address the issues that we've got so it's bringing in that data and intelligence to find out what's going on in your areas where are the gaps so we need to identify the those gaps and then bridge those by signposting them to the services most in need. So whether it's mental health, whether it's around issues around uh, social housing, whether it's issues around antisocial be behavior or youth nuisance, because then, you know, opportunities do arise and, and mm. uh, these things that we need to look at, how do we best work with local authorities or the, or the local police and other services to, to make sure that we can give that voice back to them? Sure, and as you said, sometimes it's easy for us to forget about those people who don't have any contact with the outside world beyond being able to physically go out and see people. There's still people out there who don't have phones uh, because of one reason or other. And as you said, access to the internet, many take it for granted, but it's actually something that uh, is not as readily available as we would think. When you look at how we can reach out to those communities, how we can particularly support those children and young people, do you think that there is enough investment? Are we ready for those challenges that a post-COVID world will present us with? Yes, and I think it's about um, lay laying the foundations that we've got. Uh, and, and I think this is where we have to acknowledge the great work uh, that our forefathers, our grandparents, and the sacrifices they gave. Um, they've given us this platform that we, you know, this generation that we've got now, four, uh, third, fourth, fifth generation that have grown up here, have had an education, have got the resources, have got the tools. It's about connecting those pieces of, of jigsaw uh, to complete the puzzle and reaching out to say, you know what, I've got dreams, I've got inspiration, I've got, I want to do well in my life, I want to do things that any other person, he or she, that they may be seeing them on their, their, in their areas or their communities or seeing them on TV and thinking, you know what, I want to do that. I want to be able to do this. Um, and then giving them the help and support within the communities, finding that space, finding that safe space environment to say, you know what, explore that idea. Mm. Let's listen to it. Given, and the key thing is to listen. And the key thing is to then uh, uh, take on board the advice that we can give them and say, right, how do we go about it? What are we going to do? Uh, and then give them that pl uh, platform to run and, and make their journey and say, you know, because I used to say to young people, you know, it's not about it's not about the distance you travel. It's the journey you take. Mm. So, you know, fly. And that is a very powerful message, particularly for yes. all of our young people that are watching, because sometimes the barriers can feel too much. The constraints can feel too much, but it's uh, 
down to people like us in the community to actually provide that inspiration, that motivation for young people. Well, what about in terms of their education? Because clearly education has been significantly affected by this as well. I was reading just this week of people that have literally lost out on the last year of their studies and they are struggling now in college, in university or wherever else they've gone on to as a result. What do we need to do for those young people, Shiraz? Yes, most definitely. You know, uh, young people now are deciding whether they they carry on with their education, whether they go to university um, and how are the, the challenges that are going to be met. Do they stay at home? Uh, some have have gone through grievances, lost family members. Um, some have some have not had connections with those loved ones. For example, those that were stuck in different countries. I mean, I was stuck in Pakistan uh, during the red list last year, so uh, nine months away for me. So I could understand when family members are away from their loved ones and what their challenges that they have. Um, but if for young people, there are a lot of services out there, uh, and and the, the key thing is to seek that help early on. Mm -hmm. uh, don't think you're on your own. Don't think you're alone. Nobody's going to listen to you. Don't think that it's a stupid question to ask. You know, reach out, ask for help ask for guidance. Um, there are a lot of organizations and people out there and there's better qualified people than myself out there uh, that have the know-how. Feel free to go out and reach out to them and say, excuse me, I need some help. What do you think? Um, do I think I should continue with my studies? Do I need to take a gap year out? Um, do I need to get a job because I need to support my rest of my family members? Um, and encouraging boys and girls, you know, at the end of the day to say, look, the world is out there. What do you want to do? Life is going to continue, but it's going to be, we're going to have to adapt and adapt to the situations that we're in. So, you know, reach out to people, help and get that support and do well in life. Um, and we, we wish everyone the success they can have. Mm. And where's the future of youth work now, Shiraz? What, what's the evolution of youth work looking like in, in your view? It's clearly been through some very challenging times, first of all, post-2008 economically, now the challenges of COVID. Where does it go next? Yes, and I think, the, uh, for me, the key thing is, yes, we don't have a magic wand that we can just wave everything and say, you know what, bring back the good times. Uh, we are where we are, and we have to start from where we're at at the moment. And that means then reflecting upon, uh, taking, up, taking on board, uh, situational things that are reality on the ground. So identifying those issues, identifying those problems, uh, and then saying to ourselves, what do we need to do? What's the If there's training to be provided for young people, if there's courses that they need to go on, uh, if there's places that they need to to go and learn about certain areas or subjects, give them that, give them the help and space to say, go and learn, go and develop. You know, we want to bring them back uh, to say that they can give back to the communities. Because I used to say to them, you know, always go and do your degrees, go do your education, help and about, but always come back and give back to your community as well. Whether it's one or two hours of volunteering, whether it's going knocking on somebody's door, whether it's having that phone conversation to somebody mm. down the road to say hi or bye, you know, always give back. Because once you give back, you'll always receive back as well. Um, so I think for us, it's, it's about encouraging that uh, change and saying, you know what, there are opportunities. Uh, and, you know, for me, We've invested in some of our young people in Rochdale here now last year where we did an online course at home um, and, and 10 to 15 of these young people have become sports coaches uh, and they're now working in within their own localities, within their own communities, and they were able to then develop, uh, to deliver their sessions in their own areas with young people. Wow. Um, so they received first aid, they received a first aid course, they received uh, safeguarding training, um, sports coach training. Uh, so now we have a team of uh, staff that I have that can work in different localities and, and, and areas. And whenever the holidays arrive, we know that we can put on sports activities, one area, arts and crafts, holiday activity fund. You know, we've got organizations here that uh, are, are, trust, are, trust, are trusting us and know what we're doing. Uh, and we work in partnership with them. Um, and we know that whenever the holidays arrive now, it just, just recently now, we just had the local, uh, sorry about the phone call. Um, we just had some uh, local people uh, that invested in us in, in one of the youth provisions that we had. Um, and we had 50 to 60 young people doing swimming. Uh, we booked out the whole swimming pool um, and we just brought young people in to say, you know what, 
people have had testing times, they're at home, it's very difficult. How can we best and help and support them? Give the parents a bit of a respite. And, you know, these young people now are going to become the future of Mohammed Shiraz. Or I say to them, don't become me. Go and become yourself and become bigger and better. Mm. We'll, we live, we, we are here, what we've done. But go and do something bigger and better and give back to the communities. You are the future. You're the challenge. You know, so out, you're going to, you know, you're going to outlive us. But we want you to continue to do well and make sure that this is where you the services are. This is where the local authority is. This is where the decision makers are. Mm -hmm. So the young people are sat there on the decision making table and making those decisions that will impact on the wider community. What an inspirational message to conclude with there. Muhammad Shadar, it's been an absolute pleasure and honour having you on Behind the Headlines today, not only sharing with us your journey, but also words of inspiration, motivation, the living examples of young people that you're working with and how their lives have been transformed because of the youth and community work that you have so wonderfully provided for them and also your words of inspiration for the future as well in terms of where young people need to go, where we as a society, as a community need to go post the coronavirus pandemic and the other challenges that we have. Really appreciate your time today on the program, Shiraz. It's been an honour having uh, Shiraz Saab here with us on the show today. It's been an honour having all of you watch the program this evening. Remember, it's your program. So any thoughts, any comments, any questions that you have, please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. Please remember us and each other in your du'as. See you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.